Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to Watches Tonight. Hello, guys. Welcome back to episode number seven of The Trading Desk. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to The Watch Insider. My name is Brian, and thank you all for logging on. The best and worst watches of 2018 to date. Ours is a front-loaded industry. You see pre-SIHH stuff in October, November, December of the prior year. And then SIHH hits, and the Basel brands start releasing stuff during SIHH. Then you see pre-Basel stuff, and the SIHH brands show you stuff that they tease on the eve of Basel to steal Basel's thunder. And pretty much everything comes out at Basel because, let's face it, Swatch Group, Rolex, LVMH, and Paddock. But here's the thing. We can now take stock of what's come and basically hand out the awards for the year because that's just the way our industry swings. So let's reflect on the best and the worst of 2018. Hits first. I'm going to award category size recognitions to the year's best. So category style, biggest surprise. I was thinking the IWC Paul Weber, but Richemont's done a jumping hour, jumping minute with Longa. The Omega Seamaster Diver 300 meter limited edition in rose gold, titanium, and tantalum was a big surprise. Not because they chose to make this a special edition on an anniversary or it's 25 years since we saw the first Seamaster 300 meter divers, but because they chose to pay tribute to a relatively obscure tritone chronograph from the 1993 debut year, a watch I once called the perfect Bond watch for a Bond villain. So, an obscure version of a popular watch line. I love the logic, but there's more going on here. 2,500 pieces, 13,000 US dollars. I think this is going to be one of the few two-tone, okay, tritone watches that you can buy at list and expect to hold its value at list. I think it's going to be that popular. After watching the Spectre 300 meters hold their value, and that was a 7,007 piece in steel. That was a 7,007 piece limited edition. I think 2,500 of these will absolutely reward those who choose to go big and not go home. Miami Beach style, but I think it wears well anywhere. A timeless design. The longest legged of the Seamasters. Think of another Seamaster design that's lasted a quarter century. I can't. Finally, this thing could actually steal sales from Blancpain, the appointed purveyor of luxury dive watches at Swatch. Let the games begin. Okay, best dress watch. This one hits close to home because I seriously thought about buying it. Alango Unzona Saxonia Thin Copper Blue. Okay, forget the triple split. This was the story of longest 2018. Take a good look at that. If we can go full screen, guys, I'd be much obliged. An emotional force of nature masquerading as a watch. That's what this copper blue is. A relentless torrent of power and grace from a brand that needs exactly this watch at exactly this moment. 39 millimeters in diameter by 6.2 millimeters thick in white gold. Solid silver dial with blue glass scattered with copper flakes. This is a sensation. Delicate, distinctive, so longa, and yet warmer and more approachable than its typical Teutonic style. For once, a longa caliber is not the highlight of the watch. Yeah, the caliber 093 is handsome and whatnot, but for once, I don't want to wear a longa upside down on my wrist. And that's a good thing. This is the new face of the brand. This could be longa's FP Journe Chronomet Bleu. It's sized to compete at 39. It's styled to compete without being derivative. And at 22,000 US dollars, it's priced within about 800 US bucks of Journe's heavy hitter, Longa. This thing needs to be the new flagship. If not by price, by beauty and stature. Please don't let this one get forgotten. Put some ad money into this. Your brand and your collectors and your fans will thank you. Why don't we sort of continue down the line? We will start with, uh, you know, of course, a Tim Masso favorite. Here we have a JLC Reverso from the, I'd call it 1935 to 1945. This is a Jaeger LeCoultre Reverso that was made for a retailer, Favre Labre at the time, which actually is now, is it, it's, a, it's a watch brand now, isn't it? Yeah, Favre Labre today is actually owned by Tata of India, the fine people who own Jaguar and Land Rover. One large conglomerate. They've just been recapitalized. They are a watch brand again in their own right. Uh, back then, they were also a retail arm that had this watch, Chagere Le Coult co-branded. As you can see, both signs on the recessed center part of the dial. It's beautifully aged. This is one of the rare cases where I'll say patina is not just damage degrading the watch. It does give it character without compromising any of the original printing or appliques. I actually like the way this one's aged. 
It's got a sort of parchment effect to it. Yeah, me too. I mean, it almost looks like it's a paper dial, but it's not. And, you know, I tend to agree with you. I think that this is, you know, this is one of those times where, you know, uh, I'm extraordinarily happy that the dial wasn't wasn't cleaned off or changed or modified in any way. You know, what you're looking at is the, you know, the original iteration of the watch and just how it can age over time. On the back there, you've got engraving. You know, I can't say if that's from the original owner or sometime in the future and after that, but it says, you know, BB on the back. Uh, you know, this particular watch I think is great if you're looking to pick up, you know, a vintage Reverso. I don't, did you already mention about the stainless steel? Uh, yes, it's first generation Staybrite stainless steel, the kind that was originally designed for kitchen utensils, and you can see right on the back, stay bright, Ossier stay bright, so steel stay bright. This was a major innovation in the watch industry starting in the 1920s. Through several iterations, stay bright helped to introduce stainless steel to watchmaking. Previously, if you weren't going to buy gold, oftentimes silver was used, and steel really helped to usher the end of silver-cased watches. So this was historically important on a couple of levels. Caliber 411 in this one, it's a manual wind center second JLC-shaped caliber. The original reversos said only reverso on the dial because, frankly, LeCoultre had very little to do with them other than subcontracting them. Uh, Wenger made the cases and Tavanas actually made the movement as LeCoultre didn't have a shaped caliber for the case back in 1931. By 1935 when this wa well this center second caliber bowed uh, you finally had in-house caliber LeCoultre movements in the reverses, reversos and thus they were signed. Gégère Lecoult, as at that point a company called Specialty Ologère had been established between Gégère and Lecoult to distribute the Reverso, and that company actually became the modern Gégère Lecoult with the dual branding subsequently. So I believe this watch was made between 1935 when the movement became available and roughly 1945 when Reverso production largely ceased for a generation. It was simply too pre-war for tastes of the post-war era. And, you know, we, we went back and forth a little bit uh, definitely, this is the kind of watch where I would probably move this over to a strap. I think it would be much better suited to, um, you know, a, a, a cool strap to, you know, to fit the watch and give it a, you know, a better look than that bracelet. We're going to move into uh, what I would consider an advanced collector. Um, this guy here. I mean, uh, why, don't, why don't you talk about this watch a little bit? I'll let you have um, the... I, I love this watch. Um, one, Laurent Ferrier is probably right now my uh, probably one of my top brands that I, I just fell in love with over you know the past year and a half. Um, really, really modern designs. I'm a big uh, fan of Patek, and to me, Laurent Ferrier is just a very modern Patek. I don't know something about it. It's just very, very sophisticated and um, refined. The movements are just outstanding. Um, if you ever get a chance to see one in person, which is very hard, I think they make 120 pieces a year yeah. or something around I that think number. One, uh, when I talked to him, I think it was like 140 to 160 pieces. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so it's a very, very low production. Um, maybe Dufour is maybe smaller than that. Um, uh, this one's the uh, Galay Traveler uh, World. Uh, yeah, this is, is the, the world. world. This is the uh, the South America, every right? yeah, yeah, South America. So you know, uh, hand painted enamel dial, such a deep blue, such a big dial. What you have to think about, especially uh, enamel world timers, there's a few out there from a few different brands. What I love about this, this encompasses the whole dial. You know, it's so you see everything. The depth of the ocean is awesome. The coloring is beautiful, and it's truly um, a work of art. And this is definitely for the advanced collector, somebody who really, really knows what they're looking for in a the watch. They're maybe somebody who travels a lot, but somebody who also appreciates the fine craftsmanship that goes into a watch, like the Lauren Ferrier Traveler, but also the the quality of the enamel craftsmanship yeah, as well. See if we can get the which is three dimensional like, aspect of this it, enamel. It's outstanding, and it does have that little three-dimensional depth, you know, the cameras make there it a little, little brighter, but it's it's just a beautiful piece. So, so definitely somebody who's at that stage, you have a few uh, Pateks in the collection already, you have a few uh, Effie Jordan, just things of that nature, you just want something really, really special, I, I definitely su suggest Lauren Ferrier, and that that, that Gala Travel is just outstanding. Yeah, so they, all the all the Ferriers are fantastic and would definitely qualify as, you know, Again, like I said, I don't qualify. I don't quantify, you know, the advanced collector with a certain price point. But for me, even though this happens to be the most expensive of the three, um, not necessarily intentional. For me, what this watch stands for is that all the tiny, minute little details that you pay extra money for are for you, yeah. right? So the micro rotor on the back—that's all. Everything's done by hand. That movement is 
in my opinion, prettier than a dial. Yeah. Right. I and, wear that and backwards. We, I've, yeah, exactly. We joke about in the office, you know, I would just flip it around and wear it the other way on certain watches, right? The data. Right? Yeah. I've said that before. Oh, the data graph 39. I flipped that around. I would love to just stare into that movement. Who cares what the time is? But um, same thing with this watch. So that's kind of like a hidden treasure that's for you. And the dial is gorgeous. But then when you look down into the date wheel and all, you know, and the finishing on the date wheel, stuff like that is what makes this an advanced piece where when you're buying something like the Bell & Ross, you know, you're you're ecstatic at that point because you're getting a GMT flyback, automatic yeah. chronograph, Swiss made watch with the sapphire crystal, and you're only spending X amount of money, but you don't even know yet what could be, right? What exists. So that the guy that, you know, I see some comments in the chat and people are like, well, what if the beginning collector has an, uh, you know, an X budget, right? There's unlimited money. Yep. But that guy is beginning his path. He doesn't even know that something like the, the Laurent Ferrier exists. Right or doesn't even know that know. some of the details that are the differential between these two watches are such a so vast. So really, what the you know what I really wanted to hammer home is that it's not about a price point, right? It's not about what the watch is. It's about the collect the collection, right? Now you can do it with anything. Yep. Should we do Should we do a Rolex? Let's jump to the fifties. Let's jump to the fifties. Okay. Go for it. So here we have a Rolex reference 5508 Samariner small crown. And what differentiates this watch from, you know, the Mill Sub and Comex and, you know, let's well, call it the, the Samariner in general. Well, here, here's the thing. This came a lot earlier than almost all of the 60s and 70s Mill Subs and Comexes. So this, this is the 5508, a reference made from roughly 1957 to 1961. It is the original no crown guard, bi-directional rotating bezel, 100 meter Rolex Submariner. Now, after the 6200, there were some changes to the dial, the arrival of Mercedes hands. You can see this one is gilt style. And the reason that oftentimes the depth rating was in silver was because the rest of the dial was standardized across the big crowns, which were 200 meter rated, and the small crowns, like the 5508, which are 100 meters rated. And so you'd have that silver stamp to distinguish which watch the dial ultimately went into, even though the dials were serialized exactly the same, save that one stamp. Now the watch is 37 millimeters in diameter because these early no crown guard subs were a little bit smaller. Even as late as the 1680, which ran into the early 1980s, that was the first sub with a date, they were still 39.5. The sub didn't attain its full 40 millimeter current figure until roughly the early 1980s and the late 1970s with the arrival of first the 16800 and later the 168000, the first of the modern subs. Now you can see this watch is exceptionally clean and the most important thing to me is that the dial is sharp and aside from being reloomed it looks mostly original I'll also say that one thing you can never restore is the volume of the case these things tend to turn into the equivalent of a pebble in a brook as you lose all of the volume as well as the symmetry of the lugs from side to side. This one has a high 400,000 serial number and they were built in a relatively narrow range the small crowns like the uh, 6536 and the 5508 were always considered to be utilitarian pieces, often used hard and put away wet as they were effectively tools back in their day, upscale sports watches, but still very much professional articles. And dive watches didn't become a mainstream article for office use until the 1970s and ultimately the 1980s. So the survival rate on these early subs, considering how they were treated in general, is exceptionally low. It's always a rarity to see a 37 millimeter steel sub in the modern day in this kind of condition. Yeah, and what I was saying is unlike the big crowns, Comex and Mill subs, you know, what sort of distinguishes this watch is that it really hasn't been a part of the major Rolex frenzy. I think that the 5508 has sort of flown under the radar. It definitely has appreciated in value over time, you know, in that all, you know, all boats rise with a rising tide. But I still think that there's considerable value in these watches given what comparable models from the era are currently bringing you at auction and what you can purchase these watches for. Best co-branding. Here's one that's going to be a bit controversial. 
Roger Dubuis and Lamborghini, as Blancpain's 10-year shotgun marriage, awkward shotgun marriage, lurches toward divorce, were greeted by Lambo's surprisingly apropos new flame. The watches, like the cars, are brash and powered by no-holds-barred sybaretic arrogance. It's kind of Roger Dubuis' thing, but that's good because Lamborghini works the same way. The quality is there, no apologies are made, and Roger Dubuis, at least in terms of design and focus on its clientele and style, might be the single most driven and focused brand in the Richemont Labyrinth right now. 5,000 watches a year, and they're having no trouble selling them to the kind of guy who ordinarily would buy Richard Meal, which means they're right on target. And you need more evidence? Well, there's a reason that outgoing Roger Dubuis CEO Jean-Marc Pontrouet was handpicked by Richemont Kaiser Johann Rupert to run Panerai, Rupert's favorite child, as the outgoing Angelo Bonatti retires in glory. The product from Dubuis right now, especially the Lamborghini line, is convincing. Geneva Hallmark, modern materials, outrageous size and style with no compromise in finisher watchmaking. These watches deserve your respect even if you don't love them. And now, the Dubuis partnership with Pirelli, which was puzzling at first as a standalone, makes far more sense as a supporting actor than the leading role it assumed just a few months ago. The Pirelli thing finally fits. Ultimately, Richard Meal is the target. But here's the thing, Dubuis is on track for a titanic clash with Richard, and I think they've actually got the guns to go head-to-head -head with this man and his best now. Dubuis has all of the sizzle and all of the steak. As I said earlier, let the games on wrist and track begin. Okay, best sports watch. It's tough to redo one watch, so Rolex gave us four. The Rolex GMT Master II, as a family, has to sweep this category because it manages to be almost everything to all people, and yet it does so with almost zero compromise. That is the toughest assignment in the watch business. Not retro watches or revival watches, because like the Porsche 911, they draw on a heritage that is continuous. There was never a break in this lineage, and thus the GMT Master sails into 2018 in sizzling form, arguably stronger than it's ever been, so they will be sold out, waitlisted, and coveted to no end, and that includes the precious metals and two-tone. So first ever use of rose gold on Rolex GMT. I predicted it pre-Basel, and it happened. First ever two-tone on a GMT involving rose gold, doubling up on the first, and the first ever use of a Pepsi bezel, Cerachrome, on steel. So the return of Rolex's traditional GMT Jubilee bracelet option is essentially the missing in action Rolex bracelet always offered, but not since 2008. It belongs on the revival of the Pepsi in steel. Also, it protects the buyers who paid 38 grand for the white gold Pepsi from 2014 to 2017, so Relix is still doing well by its premium buyers and early adopters. Finally, it is hard to mess with success. Every brand fears updating a classic, generally takes no chances, and still comes up short. Rolex shot nothing but net from the three-point line, and if you're not familiar with idiomatic English-American expressions, that just means they tried something really hard and they executed perfectly.